I'm going to confess that it's a little intimidating as a suburban mom who works out of her kitchen to be included among so many distinguished panelists and speakers, Ivy League scholars, former White House staffers, seminary presidents, and then there's me, uh, a proud grad of what we alums like to call the Harvard of the Southwest, Arizona State. And even that, by the skin of my teeth, um, I believe the most distinguishing honor my alma mater received uh, during my time there uh, was being named Playboy's number one party school. And that was a victory to which I, I did contribute my fair share. Uh, so much so, actually, that it, it left my mind darkened and my soul sick. I took up with abandon campus culture's invitation to suppress the moral guardrails of my Christian upbringing with all manner of substances and licentiousness until an encounter with a piece of medieval Christian literature that was of course assigned in order for the class to uh, sneer at and deconstruct it, awoke my long anesthetized prodigal conscience. Suddenly I saw with clarity just how entitled and dissipated I had become. I was broken, I was lost, and whenever I was sober enough to feel it, I was deeply unhappy. In that moment, the rejected lessons of my childhood came back to me. It wouldn't paint too dramatic a picture to say that I got down on my knees and I prayed to a God I no longer believed in to help me. Uh, nothing more specific than that, just help. And he did. For the first time in my life, without being drugged there by my parents, I started going to church. It was a large evangelical congregation, and from the moment I walked through those doors, the pastors and staff surrounded me with community, and they taught me a lot of hard and necessary things. They were necessary both for my salvation in eternity, but also for my flourishing in my limited time on earth. And because these were hard, necessary things, they were also, it turned out, conservative things because that's what conservatism does. It deals realistically with fallen human nature and devises systems to restrain our worst impulses while rewarding virtue, diligence, and self-control. And that's what that church did for me. I became a new person, someone capable of pursuing a career, of paying my own bills. I, I met my husband there. I actually managed to start attending my classes as something more than an occasional visitor and I completed my long-delayed graduation. That church not only set me on a path to spiritual sanctification, it equipped me to be what I had never been up to that point, a productive, contributing citizen, a person fit for self-government. Now, that was not why I sought out that church, and it wasn't why the pastors there ministered to me, but those were the side effects of their ministry. And that is exactly what the founders uh, hoped and expected that churches, the contribution that the founders hoped and expected churches were going to make to the success of the new government they were creating. I know we've all heard that old Adams quote that our constitution was, only, was made only for a moral and religious people, wholly inadequate to the government of any other. Well, that sentiment was echoed to one degree or another by all the architects of our republic. Alexander Hamilton thought churches were so important to the American project, he wanted to form a Christian constitutional society whose object would be supporting the Christian faith among the people. George Washington wrote in his farewell address, and as Clifford said, that religion and morality are indispensable supports to political prosperity. Even the deist Thomas Jefferson called religion the best support of good government. And again, this is not to say that, uh, that this is the purpose of churches, but their purpose of bringing men to Christ and then spurring them to good works in alignment with their profession of faith is what allows for a flourishing democratic society. In fact, Adams specifically encouraged pastors to preach against such sins as are most prevalent and recommend such virtues as are most wanted. Is that what we see so many of our best-known evangelical leaders and ministries doing today? Or are they, as C.S. Lewis once observed, crying out against those vices of which our generation is least in danger? Are they running around with fire extinguishers where there are floods?
What we have seen in the last few years is the president of the Southern Baptist Convention, the largest and most influential Protestant denomination in the United States, suggest that Christians talk too much about sexual sin. He's argued that churches need to show more hospitality to people who believe they are transgendered by using preferred pronouns, has a name, pr uh, pronoun hospitality. We have witnessed the public theologian and now editor-in-chief of Christianity Today warning about too much masculinity in our churches. We have professors at the largest seminary in the US, a staunchly conservative seminary, by the way, teaching that the theology curriculum needs to be decolonized from whiteness. The provost at that same school has said that as a white man, he is and will always be racist because, and this is a direct quote, he is immersed in a culture where he benefits from racism all the time. These are the well-known examples. Let's look at one that is not so well-known because it only happened two weeks ago. The National Association of Evangelicals represents 45,000 churches in dozens of Protestant denominations. The group has been so influential among evangelicals. In 1983, it was where Ronald Reagan went to deliver his famous evil empire speech at their national convention. On August 29th of this year, the NAE released a report pressing the theological issue of climate change. It was titled, Loving the Least of These. Now, what that title implies is that if you do not think that Christians need to advocate for climate change policies, you are not loving the least of these. The report contends that becoming a climate change activist is part of, quote, manifesting Christ's love and calls it a, quote, gospel issue within the lordship of Christ. Not only that, it claims that creation care another term, is part of the Great Commission. Direct quote. They're saying it is part of Christ's command to bring the good news of salvation to the lost. Climate change. A few more quotes from that uh, document. We cannot claim to love God while abusing what belongs to Christ. Jesus tells us, if you love me, keep my commands. Now, keep in mind, the abuse they're referring to here simply refers to driving gas-powered cars, turning on our air conditioning at the rate we do now. If we don't agree that regulations are needed to curb these things, this means, the NAE says, we cannot claim to love God. So what kind of actions does the NAE think Christians need to engage in in order to love God and obey his commands? We need to, quote, severely cut greenhouse gas emissions. We need to advocate for government and corporate action. We need to, quote, pass legislation that helps speeds up the transition to renewable energy and decreases the use of fossil fuels. Okay, well, <laughs> if you're gonna claim that Christians are failing to love and obey God if they don't want to advocate for government action or pass legislation, then you better have impeccable sources and weigh all sides. The NAE's report, its most cited scientific authority for this, the UN. Specifically, its Intergovernmental Panel on Climate Change, a deeply politicized body that has been awash in corruption scandals for suppressing study results and faking research findings. The NAE never even mentions the highly credentialed scientists who do not believe that climate change is caused by human activity, never mind engaging with their arguments. Instead, they warn, direct quote, don't look for good information from angry people who refer to conspiracy theories. So questioning human-caused climate change makes you a conspiracy theorist. If that's not enough spiritual manipulation, here's one more. In a section on how our care of creation affects our witness, the NAE says people need to see that Christians understand what causes natural disaster. If you don't view the issue the way the environmental activists think you should, the NAE says you are damaging the reputation of Christ. All of this will sound familiar if you follow the evangelicals uh, parroting and promoting the COVID propaganda of former NIH director Francis Collins, otherwise known as Anthony Fauci's boss. Nearly every tactic we saw with Collins and COVID is repeated in the NAE's report. Whereas here, lobbying your legislators for climate change is loving your neighbors, 
They're wearing masks meant loving your neighbors. Getting the vaccine that is not actually a vaccine was loving your neighbors. Keeping churches shut down for months was loving your neighbor. Failure to do these things was failure to obey God, and those who resisted this narrative were damaging the witness of the church to the watching world. How did that shake out? Whose credibility came out of COVID damaged? It wasn't the Christians who were questioning the authorities. Collins and his evangelical celebrity friends never talked about the small business owners forced to close their doors. They never talked about the children who fell severely behind on learning because their schools were closed or the deaths of despair of addicts and depressed people left in isolation. You know who the NAE never talks about in its report on loving your neighbor? Poor families struggling because housing and gas have become more expensive due to environmental regulations. Or Dutch farmers whose government has told them they cannot continue earning a living. Or the people of Sri Lanka protesting in the streets over food and power shortages because of the green policies its government enacted. Are those people our neighbors? What about the people who work in the coal industry in West Virginia or the oil and gas industry in Texas? But maybe you say, okay, the NAE is wrong to insist that Christians become climate change activists, but I'm sure that they're going to speak to some other pressing issues of, of biblical significance. How many reports has the NAE issued on the transgender social contagion capturing the minds of adolescents and even younger children? They've done two now on climate change. How many resolutions on how trans ideology conflicts with the Bible's teaching? They've issued four resolutions on environmentalism. So how many op-eds or essays from NAE leaders on the erasure of women and girls as a class of persons? They've got any number of those on what they, again, call the church's creation care mandate. But when it comes to the issue of the transgender movement, the answer to all of these is none, not one. Funny how that concern for the most vulnerable becomes less pressing when it meets a topic that doesn't align with the priorities of corporate DEI departments and Davos. There are dozens more examples that I could give you of leftist political priorities disguised with tortured Christianese jargon being given the weight of gospel truth. If they wanted to debate the scientific evidence for the issue, that would be fine. If they wanted to make a straightforward argument for certain legislation, that would also be fine. But that's not what they're doing. They're twisting scripture to heap a burden of pharisaical leftist legalism on Christians. They are creating a new extra biblical class of sins like white privilege and carbon emissions, and they're selling indulgences for them. The price is your activism and your compliance. About this time last year, my husband, that husband that I met and married and formed a stable family with thanks to that church, uh, we took an anniversary trip to Boston. And while we were there, we visited the King's Chapel. Note the Kings. Our guide explained to us that the British monarchy funded it to help establish the influence of the state over the independent-minded independent believers in the, in the colonies. Its purpose was to quiet their resistance to make them believe God's will for them was to acquiesce to the ruling powers. That wouldn't be the last time an overseas agent leveraged American churches to exert political power. In Paul Kanger's book, The Devil and Karl Marx, an ex-communist describes how in the 1940s, he and his comrades deliberately infiltrated mainline Protestant denominations to win them over to the Soviet cause. He called those pastors suckers. They would go on to use social justice terminology that sounded sort of biblical to argue for Marxist policies. They were atheists. And how did that work out? How many true disciples of Christ are being made in those churches draped in rainbow and Black Lives, Ma Black Lives Matter flags today? Those churches are not equipping their flocks as either saints or citizens. If churches and pastors faithfully preaching the word provides the best support for good government, then it stands to reason that pastors doing something else can also be its most effective destabilizers. Around 35% of the US population describes themselves as evangelicals. Among Americans who self-identify as conservatives, Protestant evangelicals are the single largest religious bloc by more than 23 points. 
What does that mean? It means that as go evangelicals, so goes conservatism. And so, I believe, goes the United States. Christianity is going to be fine. It's going to be more than fine. It's going to be victorious. But the project of American self-government cannot survive without it. And there is one more loss that's a little more personal to me. When the next Megan enters the door of an evangelical church, is it going to transform her life? Will she, in the strength of the Christ they teach her, become a strong, involved mother and wife capable of standing up before you and speaking today? Maybe not. And maybe that is the point. Thank you.